Good afternoon. We're going to start tonight with a test two review. So we're going to be going over the topics of set theory, predicate calculus, recursion, and induction. And primarily we'll just answer people's questions. So I hope that you all have some. I think that most of you do. And we'll work some problems and then at the end I'll do a few big O problems because you will have a homework due on those like one week after the test. So you'll need to have at least a little bit of review of that so you can work on it after you're done with the test. Okay, so does anyone have any questions ready? Because if you don't, I'll just work some problems. Yes? Whenever you are supposed to find the recursive form from the closed form, how do you go about proving your recursive form by induction? Right. So the question is, we have to find the recursive form from the closed form? Right, and then the main question I have with that is proving by recursion, I mean by induction. So the question is, how do we prove by induction? And my answer is exactly the same way as if you had found it the opposite direction. So if I found, if I knew the closed form, sorry, if I knew the, this one assumes that I know the closed form and I find the recursive form. Usually we do it the other way around. We know the recursive form and we find the closed form. We want to do the proof the exact same way. So what I always do is I assume that the recursive form is correct and prove the closed form is correct. Why is that okay as a method of proof? If the recursive form I'm trying to prove that they're equal. So it doesn't matter which one I start with. If I prove, if I assume that A is one thing, and I want to show that B is equal to whatever A is, and I end up doing that, that's fine. It, doesn't, it works the same as if I assume that I know what B is, and I show that A is equal to what that is. So it doesn't matter which one I start with. That's why I always do it like this, because then I can do all my proofs the same way. I can assume the recursive form is correct, and then prove the closed form is correct. So let's say we have um, a problem where we have closed form and then we can prove it by um, induction. So let me do one of those. So I'll just make one up. S of n equals, sorry, S of 0 equals 1. I need a basis. Actually, I do need to write the closed form, right? So if I define a problem, we want to do a closed form problem. So say someone tells you that S of n is 3 to the n plus 1. And we have to find the recursive form and prove true by induction. So the very first step is to find the recursive form. And we can use our cheat method for that, right? Yeah. So let's review. Uh, briefly what the cheat method is, is to use our closed form formula to get a previous term, say s of n minus 1, and then I subtract them. So s of n minus s of n minus 1 is equal to 3 to the n plus 1 minus 3 to the n minus 1 plus 1. Solve for s of n. And I think one. that should be a minus right there. It's also S of n minus 1 in the next And that's a minus also. Sorry about that. So we have S of n equals S of n minus 1 plus 3 to the n plus 1 minus 3 to the n minus 1 minus 1. So you can double check that on your own paper when you write it. So then I have to do a basis. And how many points do I need in my basis based on this recursive formula? I need just one because I look back one. So I have one previous term here. So I can define S of 0 using the closed form definition. That's equal to 3 to the 0 plus 1, which is equal to 2. So now we have a recursive definition. And if I have to prove this by induction, I do want to reduce this. Like 
if it didn't say prove true by induction, then I would stop here. I'm done. I would put a little square around these two. And I wouldn't bother doing any algebra because I might make some mistakes. Right? And it's really easy for your grader to grade this. They can just see if you plugged in and subtracted. So here I would want to factor this if I've got to prove this by induction. I wouldn't want to mess with this thing over and over again. So S of N equals S of N minus 1. Let's put the 3's together. The plus 1 and minus 1 cancel. So I do plus 3 to the N, sorry, minus 3 to the N minus 1. I factor a 3 to the N minus 1 out of both of them. So the first one is 3 times 3 to the N minus 1, and the second one is just minus 1 times that. So this is equal to S of N minus 1 plus 2 times 3 to the N minus 1. What's that thing above um, next to the 3N on the, on the first part? This? Yeah. It's a scribble. Yeah. Okay, so this is a much simpler recursive definition to prove by induction. If I have to do an induction proof, I want to make it as simple as possible because I have to look at it a few times. So then, in our proof, we have to start with the basis, right? In our proof, we start with the basis. How many points do I need in the basis? I need as many as I need in the original basis. I also need as many as however many terms are on the right-hand side of the recursion. So those are two ways to remember. So I need one basis point. I'll write it again on the top of this. So we actually assume that this recursion is true even though we just found it we're going to assume that it's true and we're going to prove that s of n equals 3 to the n plus 1 so that plus 1 is not in the power it's just there so let's try and make that a little bit larger for you guys All right. so this works exactly the same way as if I already knew this and I was trying to prove the closed form. So once I find both of them, I do this proof the same way as I would always do. So our basis starts with S of 0. My recursive form gives me 2. My closed form gives me 3 to the 0 plus 1, which is 1 plus 1. That's equal to 2. And then I look at my recursive definition. Whatever S's are on the right-hand side, that's what I put in my assumed statement. I write them in closed form. So S of N minus 1, I write that using the formula, 3 to the N minus 1 plus 1, and then I prove that the left-hand side of the recursion, S of N, has the closed form. How did you get S's to be 2 and I'm trying to figure out blocking how did I get 2? Well, 3 to the 0 plus 1 is equal to 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2, right? That's how I found the basis in the first place. And for the second place, did you put something for S and the minus 1? I didn't use that to find my basis. I used the closed form to find my basis, which is what we always do. Well, actually, I have to do this. This is from the recursive form. I always have to do one of each. This is from the closed form. Right, in my basis, I actually have to have one from the recursive form and one from the closed form. I don't use a recursive definition, this thing, if it's in the basis. If you remember how we wrote our code for a recursion, what we did is we had an if statement. If n equals zero, we did the basis. If not, we did the recursive step. So if you already have it here, if you already have it defined, don't use the formula to get it because the formula won't give it to you if it's the basis, right? That's a big problem, so it won't work if you don't have a basis. You won't be able to find that basis value. Okay, so from here, we start with recursive definition. And I know that I wrote down this whole procedure for doing recursive proofs, right? We start with writing our recursive definition, which was S of N equals S of N minus 1 plus 2 times 3 to the n minus 1. So I started with that. 
then I plug in from the assume statement, I do a substitution. And hopefully I'm doing the same algebra that I did partly to figure out the recursion in the first place. So it should come out the same way. So this is equal to 3 to the n minus 1 times, there's one of them there, plus two of them over there, plus 1. So that's 3 to the n minus 1 times 3, plus 1. And 3 to the n minus 1 times 3 is? 3 to the n plus 1. And that's exactly what I wanted in my proof statement. Those are the same, so I'm done with my proof. Are there questions about this one? I realize that everyone's writing it down right now, but if you have a question, please ask, and I'll answer it while you're writing. So the answer to the question was, do it exactly as if you had found whichever one. Either way, whatever you're given first, assume that recursion is true and prove the closed form is true. Because they're equivalent, and this one's easier just to remember one. Um, does anyone else have a question that they wanted answered today? About, um on the exam review, page two, you want to just see it? Um, I have that. Exam review, page two. Page two, first problem. I think I have it. Now, let me see yours. You want, which problem would you like to do? The first one? Okay, this one's done in your notes and done rather well, but I'll go over it. So I want to prove that this function is divisible by 8. Now, if I were to do an arithmetic proof for this, how many cases would I have? Eight. I would have 8 cases, and what would they be? 0, 1, 2, 8K, 0 through 7. 8K plus 1 to 8K plus 7. That's right. I would have 8K, 8K plus 1, all the way up to 8K plus 7, right? But this one's too hard to do because then I have 8s in powers, and that doesn't tell me anything about whether it's divisible by 8 or not. So. I have to prove that 8 divides this. That's how you write that. 8 divides this. And I can prove it by induction. So we start with a basis. Let's say n equals 0. So we get 5 to the 0 plus 1 plus 2 times 3 to the 0 plus 1. That's going to be 5 squared. Sorry, 5 to the 1. That's just 5 just 5, plus 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1, that all equals 8, that's divisible by 8, right? Now we assume that the function is divisible by 8, so we assume that 8 divides 5 to the n plus 1, plus 2 times 3 to the n plus 1, and we prove that 8 divides, now we just take this formula and replace all the n's with n plus 1, just like we normally do. So we get 5 to the n plus 2, <clears throat> plus 2 times 3 to the n plus 1, and add 1 there, just like the previous one. That's our setup. Now, what is the next step in a regular induction proof? We want to write the proof statement in terms of the assumed statement so that we can use what we know. So we want to write this formula. That's like P of n plus 1. We want to write that in terms of P of n. So 5 to the n plus 2 plus 2 times 3 to the n plus 1 plus 1. We want to write that in terms of one of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get a 5 to the n plus 1 out of this term and a 2 times 3 to the n out of that term. So this is equal to 5 times 5 to the n plus 1, right? Because that's 5 to the n plus 2, plus 2 times 3 times 3 to the n, because I have 3 to the n plus 1 in the second term, plus 1. And then I just want to move out the terms that are from the assumed statement. I'll move those out front. So that's equal to 
Well, I have 5 times 5 to the n plus 1, but that's equal to 5 to the n plus 1 plus how many of them? Four of them, because if I have five of them, that's equal to one plus four. And this one is plus, that's six times three to the n, and I want two, so that's actually two times three to the n plus four times three to the n, because I had six of them, and then I leave my plus one. Now I'm going to move these underlined terms out to the front, because they are ones that are in my assumed statement. So that's equal to 5 to the n plus 1 plus 2 times 3 to the n plus 1. I'll put brackets around it because I know I'm going to replace that. Plus 4 times 5 to the n plus 1 plus 4 times 3 to the n. Now I already know that the stuff in brackets is divisible by 8, so I can write actually if I wanted that it's eight, some 8k, eight right? It's 8 times something. So I would continue on. What I hope is that just the rest of those terms add up to make something divisible by 8. And then I'll be done. So this is, this is from the assumed statement that I'm going to replace all those things in brackets with 8k plus 4 times 5 to the n plus 1 plus 4 times 3 to the n. So all I need to do now is figure out is that divisible by 8. Well, this is, so all I have to do is prove that the rest is divisible by 8. So, prove So I have to prove that's divisible by 8. Well, it's already divisible by 4, right? Mm -hmm. So I factor out a 4. That's 4 times 5 to the n plus 1 plus 3 to the n. So if this is divisible by 4 and I want the whole thing to be divisible by 8, I just need to get another 2 out of there, right? So this needs to be divisible by 2. Is it? Yeah. Why? Because two odd numbers always make an even number. That's right. It's divisible by 2 because it's the sum of two odd numbers. Odd plus odd always makes it even. And powers of 5 are always odd and powers of 3 are always odd. So since... 5 to the n plus 1 is odd, and 3 to the n is odd, then the sum is even. And so this number is divisible by 8, so therefore 4 times 5 to the n plus 1 plus 4 times 3 to the n is divisible by 8, and so therefore our whole function to begin with was divisible by 8, because that's all we had left to prove because the rest we knew was divisible by 8 by the assumption. Do you have a lot of arithmetic proofs on these terms? No, there won't be a lot of arithmetic proofs. I'm working on your exam. I was working on it today. There should be around 10 problems, and there's probably one or two arithmetic proof problems, like two page, maybe two pages of them, but that's it. So... When you're doing an arithmetic proof, I mean, how do you get the number of cases that you need to prove? I know the even or odd to start off with, but how do you, you mentioned before, if you had to prove that it was divisible by eight, you'd have to have eight cases or something like that. That's right. So that's a good question. The question was, how do I know how many terms or how many cases I need to have in an arithmetic proof? Can anybody answer that question? So what you're dividing is fine. So right, so if I'm proving divisibility, then the whole point is to find that number within my function. So the way of breaking down the cases, the way we've been doing it, is the way to insert that number into a function. So say I have some function, n squared plus 5n plus 3, and I want to figure out, you know, is it divisible by... 2 even, whatever number I'm testing, I want to get that number in there. So what I do is I say n is equal to whatever that number is times k, and then all of those plus the possible remainders. So whatever that number is, that's how many cases I'll have. So there's two cases since I'm checking for divisibility by 2. 
So if I was checking for divisibility by 100 and I wanted to do a proof without doing an induction proof, I would have 100 cases. Because I would say 100K, 100K plus 1, all the way up to 100K plus 99. Because that's all the possible remainders. And every number is represented that way because if I divide a number by 100, it has exactly one of those remainders. So in this case, what I would do is I'd make a table for n in the function. I would plug in my values for n underneath it. That's just like making our truth table. So when we have zeros and ones, but here we have functions underneath n. And then I would plug them in. So this would be 4k squared plus 10k plus 3. That's not divisible by 2, right? And then I'd have 4k squared plus 4k plus 1 plus 10k plus 5 plus 3. So then 5 and 3 and 1 end up to make 9. So that's 4k squared plus 14k plus 9. And that's not divisible by 3 and that's not divisible by 3. So what I'd actually do is make a column. I'd make a column for 3 divides f of n, and I'd put true or false. So this is false, and this is false. So actually, this is a proof that this is always odd, right? This function is always odd. You, you wrote, you mean 2 divides f of n? Sorry, 2. So I'm writing 3's all the time. Usually we do proofs with 3, right? Because that's sort of like a, you have to do more than 2 things, but not too many. Yes. When you go how you find the cases again, I didn't understand that. So I, 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 I take the number. I take the number and say n is that number times some other integer. Okay. And then I have to. Not all numbers are written that way, right? Not all numbers are divisible by two. So I actually have to write n is equal to that number times k plus any possible remainder I might have if I divide by that number. Which, is all, which can only be one, right? Well, for two, it's only one. But say this number was seven, then how many cases would I have? I don't see the... How many remainders are there? You can always figure it out, even if you forget. Is it five? If I divide any number by seven, what are the possible remainders? What's the first one? Zero, right? I might have a remainder of zero, like 21 has a remainder of zero if I divide by seven. If I divide two by seven, what's the remainder? If I divide 3 by 7, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 numbers, 7 remainders, 7 numbers. So there's 7 cases if I was talking about divisibility by 7. So the whole point is to get that number that you're looking for to get it in the function. That's why we break it down in cases like that. Because if we don't have it, I can't look at this and tell you whether it's even or odd or what. When you said that case for 7, would you have n equals 2k, then n equals 2k no. plus 0. Now I'd have n equals 7k, n equals 7k plus 1, 7k plus 2, 7k plus 3. Okay, all the way up until you get All the way up right. to 7k plus 6. Okay. So yeah, it depends on what I'm dividing by. That's, what, that's how many cases I have, and that's how I write the function. Okay, another question. So this, all of these, all the arithmetic proofs, divisibility can be proved by induction also. So we just did an example of that. This one would probably be even easier, but when you're doing two cases, I'd rather do this than try to do an induction. So our table is um, okay for when you Table's proofs. wonderful, yes. Excellent. The whole idea of a proof is just to make something that someone else can read and understand that what you wanted to prove was true. This is really easy to read. These are all the cases for n. That's what happens to the function when I plug those values in. And this tells me if it's divisible or not. And I can look at this really fast and tell whether it was true or not. Now, I might at the bottom of this say, therefore, f of n is never divisible by 2. At the bottom. That's probably what I would write. OK, so on your test, like set theory is going to be 2. Uh, big problems. Predicate calculus will be one problem. Arithmetic proofs will be two small problems. You'll have at least two inductions and at least two recursions. Probably three recursions because the recursion problems you'll prove 
probably two of them you'll prove by induction, and one of them you'll just have to find the closed form. Yes. Can we go over set theory proof, like one of the ones? A set in the theory proof. Yeah. So let's let's take one of the problems that's in the second hour exam review and work that in class here. Let's see if I have it. I guess and I didn't. Number two as well as number one. It's right underneath it. I'll borrow that right quick. Okay. Yeah, both of these kind of problems will be on the test. So we have, this is page 16 in exam 2 review. So if we're given P is a subset of Q intersect R, and we're given that Q union S is a subset of T, we're given X1 is a member of P union S, and we want to prove that X1 is in T. Can I keep this for a second? Okay. So we're going to prove this. These are given. We're going to prove X1 is in T. So first we have to convert this to predicate calculus, and then we'll use our proof rules, just like regular, to do the proof. So in this one, that's a subset. What does subset mean? It's an if-then. It's an imply statement, right? So any point, if it happens to be in P, it's also in Q intersect R. So the first statement is for all X, P of X, that means X is in P. So I'm letting P of X equal X as a member of P and so on. So all the functions are going to be like membership functions. P of X implies Q of X and R of X because intersection is just like and, and that's given. So the second line has another subset, and we have a union there. So that's a for all X, Q of X, or S of X implies T of X, and that's given. And the third statement just has one membership there. So in that case, that's a there exists, right? There is an X1, so that X1 is in P and it's, sorry, it's in P union S. So there exists an X1, so that X1 is in, actually, I need to write in terms of my functions, right? P of X1 is true, or, that's an or function, S of X1 is true, and that's given also. And the statement I want to prove is that there exists x1 so that t of x1 is true. So the first step is to write everything in predicate calculus. Unions are just like ors, which is easy because they're made the same way. Like, you know, union just looks the very same. V and U almost look the same anyway. Intersection is upside down U and looks like an and. So the next thing to do is to figure this proof out. I want to find that t is true for, some, for x1. So I have a t in line 2. My recommendation in proofs like this is to work with all the lines that don't have there exists as long as possible and then mess with the there exists at the end. The reason why is because there exists are tricky, right? Just because I know there exists a p and there exists a q doesn't mean that I know that they're the same x. So I can't say that p and q is true. So that's why I try to skip the, the there exists for as long as possible and then use that last. So I know that I have t of x, something implies t, so if I knew this was true, I'd be done, right? So I'd like to get q or s. I don't have q or s. Let's see, I'm given x1 is in p or s. So I might actually have to construct something so I'm going to get p or s. Right. So I get P implies Q and R, but that gives me what? If I know P implies Q and R, if you go back to the set notes, like the definition from the set, P is in the intersection of Q and R, that means that P is both in Q and it's in R, right? So I can do, I can use simplification there actually. I could put P implies Q, the way I would use the simplification rule is to say Q of X and R of X logically implies Q of X, right? And then I'll use hypothetical syllogism with 
that rule. So that's just simplification all by itself. But shouldn't it be P of X? No, it shouldn't. If I know Q and X, Q and R is true, then I get Q is true. That's just simplification, like just using it straight. Right? If I know Q is true and R is true, then Q is true. That's just regular simplification rule. The reason why I did it is so I could combine 1 and 4 with hypothetical syllogism. When you have for alls, you don't have to worry about those. You just copy down the for all and use the rule the way you know it. So we have P of X implies Q of X from those two, 1 and 4 in hypothetical syllogism. And that's good because now I could probably I have Q or S implies T. I'd like something implies Q or S. So I can combine it with that. So what I want to do is OR and S on both sides of this implication, which I can do with my rules. One of my rules tells me I can do it. OR. So if I, I wanted to put an S on both sides. Sorry about that. S of X. Put brackets around that so you know that that implication is there. So we get P of X or S of X implies Q of X or S of X. That's just from 5 and the implication. I think it's just one of the implication rules. Because you can or the same thing on both sides of an implication. Multiplying by 1. It's just like multiplying by 1 on both sides or adding the same thing on both sides of an implication. Because remember, implication is just like less than or equal to. I think it's the addition like, Hmm? The addition rule? It's not addition, actually. It's probably the last rule on there. One of the last two rules, maybe. Let me see the rule sheet. Uh, it's actually not on here. But it's, I could have done one more step, putting S implies S, and then done constructive dilemma. We've done it before lots of times. So it's just, not a rule that's written on there, but it's it's an implication rule. So if you've done the proof tutorial, it's like proof number, it's number 34 or 35 because I put it in there so you could use it. Is everybody okay with doing this step? Do you believe it's true? Okay, it's not on your sheet, but I can or the same thing on both, side of, both sides of an implication just like it, I could add the same things on both sides of a less, less than or equal to. Okay. So now I can do hypothetical syllogism with line 6 and line 2, which was what the whole point of all this mess was. Because right? I, I knew I didn't need an R. That's why I wanted to get that Q by itself. So. Then I got the S with it, so I get P of X or S of X. Just copying from line 6. That implies T of X from line 2. Yeah. So 6 and 2, hypothetical syllogism. And then I can use line 3 with line 7. Modus ponens is going to give me my answer. And there, I've only had to use a there exists just once. So I don't have to be too careful with using that there exists. So the x1 in line 3, if I plug in x1 on line 7, then that means that t of x1 is going to be true, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do modus ponens with lines, what? 7 and 3. 3 and 7 going to give me there exists x1, t of x1, and that is 3 and 7 and modus ponens, and that means that x is an, x1 is a member of t. That's what t of x1 means anyway. If you want to make this easier on yourself, you don't have to put the parenthesis x everywhere, but I want to see it on your, on your proof. So you could do this little proof. It might make it a little easier. If on the side, you might write, so starting from what you had, you might just write P implies Q and R. Q or S implies T. And write P or S. And then do the proof like that. And then go back and put the functions in the quantifiers. See what I'm saying? OK, good. You could do like that, but you just have to make sure that you let me know that you understand that it's a set theory proof and you have to use set theory de definitions. But these are the same thing. You could actually let, say let little p, you know, let that mean that x is a member of p. 
You could do that too and do this proof just like that, but you still have to have the for all x's out front. Then I don't know if it shows at the end. If I did that, you just realize I said p, small p is a member of x is a member of p. Well, I still want you to write it at the end just because. I mean, you don't have to. I probably won't take off points if you don't, but fine. It's always good at the end of your proof to say, this is what I wanted to prove and therefore I just proved it. That's, that's why people write QED at the end of proofs. What is the, what do you call the little sideways U with the line under it? Subset. subset. That's the, when I read it, I say, is a subset of. And it translates to implies. It translates to implies, because if P is a subset of Q, then if I'm in P, then I must be in Q. That shows back to our Venn, de mm -hmm. Venn diagram definition. So if I say P is a subset of Q, then if I were to draw a picture of Q, if P is a subset, then every single point of P is in there. So P can be written like that. How would you write complement in terms of um, predicate complement? calculus? Complement? Uh -huh. So, can anyone answer that question? So, well, how would I write P complement in terms of predicate calculus? Draw a line over there. No, it's not. not P. That's not P. Okay, because P complement, that's all the members X that are not in P. So that would be not P of X. But I haven't, I haven't got a, a uh, quantifier for any of this. In my problem, I would be given one. Okay, so sort of in my picture of P complement, if I like draw my universe as a box and I've got P in here, the rest of the box is P complement. So anything that's not in P is P complement. Okay, so the next question, if, if everybody's okay with the set theory proofs, you, you all are very good with the proofs, by the way. Andy was telling me that you know, when you, when you guys had done proofs, you were, you were getting good at them. Maybe you've done enough of them by now. So all you have to remember on those is just how to write the predicate calculus. Then do the proof and make sure you write it correctly as you do the proof. So the next problem we we're going to do is on page 16 of the second hour review. We're going to fill in the truth table for the predicates. And we have a function... This is an interesting problem because it really shows you how those quantifiers work. So what is the universe for x and what is the universe for y in this problem? So what are the possible values for x? 1, 2, and 3. If I can write it in a, in a truth table, it's not all of the integers, it's just some of them, whichever ones I wrote in the truth table. So x is a member of the set 1, 2, 3. And y is also a member of that set 1, 2, 3. And that's why we have 9 members in the truth table. That's 3 squared, because I have 3 choices for x, 3 choices for y. So 3 times 3 is the number of rows I have. P of x, y is just a random function that somebody gave you. And 1 is when it's true and 0 is when it's false. So then what I want to do is I want to figure out my predicate calculus value. So is, is P of x true for all values of x and all values of y? No, this is false. Or it's actually, that's not empty set, just 0. Because what? There's some, there some falses in there. If that were true, I'd have all ones in my truth table. So how about there exists x, there exists a y for p of x, y? True. That's true because there's some ones in there. How about, what's the next one um, on the regular grid? For all x, there exists a y. For all x, there exists a y. So this means for each x value, I have to be able to find a y that makes p of x, y true. So I have to test how many x values? Three. Three. And I could have how many different y values? Three. 
three. I could have up to three, right? I don't have to use the same Y every time. I could use a different one. Yeah. So I have to check these, this set, that set, and that set, and there has to be a one in each one of those, which there is. Even without examining the Y values, I can tell that there's a one in each one of those three sets. So in this case, I could actually also look and see, let's see, when X equals one, Y equals one works. When x equals 2, y equals 1 also works. When x equals 3, I have to use y equals 3. So I could make a table for that if I wanted to verify to myself that it was all true. But this is a true statement. How about there exists a y for all x? False, false, false. That's false because y equals 3 seemed to be like it might be okay, but it doesn't work for x equals 1. Right? And y equals 1 was okay for 1 and 2, but not for 3. So there is no y value that works for all of the x's. That's what this says. There is a y that works for all the x's. So this is false. So the next one I would try is for all, for all y, there exists an x. So I have to test all the y values to see if there's x values that make them true. So I have to test y equals 1 and find an x that goes with it. Test y equals 2, find an x that goes with it. And test y equals 3 and find an x that goes with it. I have to do all three of those. So y equals 1, x equals 1 works just fine. y equals 2, x equals wor 1 works just fine. y equals 3, x equals 2 works. So this is fine because every single time I had a y value, I could find an x that would make the function true. And the very last thing to check is there exists an x for all y. So the question is, can I use an x value no matter what y is, and plug it in and get true for the function. No. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Two. 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 Yes, because if you look at next to x equals two, all of those are ones. So that subset of the truth table is always true when it, whenever x equals two. So p of two comma y is always true. That's what we're saying when x equals two. So this is true, and you're going to have to specify x equals two makes it true. So whenever you say a statement like this is true, you have to tell me what makes it true. Yes, David. Um, how do you know when you're looking at the um, p of x, y, and not just x and y? You, like, you know, when you look, when you're figuring out for all y, there's an x. I'm always looking at p of x, y. I didn't write it in here. I'm always looking at p. Uh, for the first one, I thought you were, okay, for the first one, all of them. looking at it. I was looking at p of x, y for all of them. Okay. I just didn't rewrite it all the time. Okay. And that's why we do a little grid also, so we don't have to write it over and over and over again. We know we're looking at p of x, y for all of them. We're just trying to figure out how often it's true. Okay. So you just have to remember that order matters on these. If the for all comes first, I have to look at every value of that. If it comes second, I have to still have to look at every value, but the same the same thing has to work for all of them. So this there exists y for all x. I had to use the same y for all the x's because I had to pick it before I went through the x's. So I try all the possible ones. I could try y equals 1, y equals 2, y equals 3, and then I have to test all the x's for it in order to see if this is true. Excuse me. Um, I'm just, I think I'm getting a little bit lost. What does it mean pxy? Is that a kind of function? Or? It's a function. It's a predicate whose values depend, whose output value depends on x and y as inputs. x and y are integers 1, 2, and 3. We don't know what the function is. We just know that the results are when x is 1 and 3 is y, the function is false. That's right. We're given this truth table. I solved this problem for this truth table. I could give you any truth table, any values for p of x and y, any inputs for x and y, and you would need to figure out how often is p of x, y true. So it doesn't actually have a meaning right here. Sometimes it'll be a function that would compare x and y or subtract them and do something funny to them, but it wasn't even given on here. It's just logical output values is what's given. Thanks. Mm -hmm. More questions? I have questions about predicate calculus and the state. Can you write them in English and they can do it Okay, so the question is, um, we have English statements with predicate calculus. This is actually not on your exam. So you only need to be able to translate the things that are like given, all people either walk or drive, stuff like that. Okay. So the stuff that's on your review sheet, 
Um, that was true for test two a while back. But since we did it on the first test, we don't have to do it on this one. And big O won't be on this And test. big O is not on this test, in case you were sweating about that. On the first page it says it is. So. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That's why I emailed you and said, big O is not on this test. It's just that the packet was made before and I didn't take it off yet because I want to move it to the third hour exam review for that time. Is my microphone not working? Battery's dead, sorry. <laughs> So, so on some of these givens, they have implications, and you know that the homework that we have at ORS, um, 11, for example, so would we have something, I think that one of these is actually an implication, and I guess I'm having trouble understanding when I need to have an implication or a hand. Mm -hmm. Or an or. The question is, how do I know I need an or or an implication? You have to read the English. That's the only answer to this question. When, I, when I'm working a predicate calculus problem, I make definitions of things using set theory and the way English is. So you have to use your brain. Like, I don't expect a computer to be able to come do this stuff. Okay, so all people are quiet. I would write for all x. Q of X if X are just people, right? If I assume that X can be any animal or anything, I would have to say for all X, people of X implies quiet of X. So if X is a person, then X is quiet. So it depends on your universe also, right? So if I say X's are people, right? That's my assumption when I write it this way. My assumption here is X can be anything. Could be a number, could be a person, could be a dog, could be whatever. So at the top of this particular page that you're reading that it says X and Y are living things. So in this right, case so the neck the bottom line is the correct way to interpret that. Right, you could do that that way also. So you can actually define the problem. So that was for problem one. On this page, this is page eleven of exam two review. So problem two doesn't necessarily um, need to use that. Oh, actually, you can use those. So, yeah, I would use that too. So if I, don't, if I assume it's a living thing, then I need to use the second statement here. Right? If I'm a person, then I'm quiet. So the next statement is all non-readers cast shadows. So what does that mean? For all X. For all X. Mm-hmm. Not R um, of X. So for all people, or all actually anything, all living things um, are that are not readers. Zoom up. Can you pull the thing? Okay, so right. if they're not readers, five, then what? Then they cast shadows. So if you're a non-reader, then you cast a shadow. Casting a shadow is an S, so that's S of X. And then if I say all living things, I don't have to write anything for that because X's are living things, right? Mm -hmm. All living things are either loud or do not cast shadows. So, loud. Not Q of X. Not Q of X or. Oh, not quiet. Loud is not quiet, so. <laughs> not Q of X or, or do not cast shadows. Or not, not S of X. S of X. So you use your definitions of the functions that you have, and if you don't have any, you make them up to write them the easiest way as possible. Yes? How would you write the given in, in problem three on this page? E subset of S. Hang on. Before we go to the next oh. problem, let's finish any questions about writing this one out. So the, la the last statement on this one that we would need to prove is that all people read. So for all X, if you're a person, then you're a reader. That's what all people read would be, right? So for all x, p of x implies r of x. If I'm a person, then I'm a reader. And then I would do the proof just like I normally do any predicate calculus proof after I've written those statements. So it, the, the answer the is it depends. It <laughs> How do you know? You know by thinking about it. At the end of the proof, would you translate it back to English yes, sentences? Yes, I would. So not the whole thing. I would just say, just the therefore, one. just the last line. Yeah. Therefore, all people read, or whatever the last statement is. Okay. So, 
Someone had a question about problem number three. What was your question? So how, how would you write, write the givens or the last the given? The last given. The last given. Well, how do I write P as a subset of S? So I have P as a subset of S. Complement. So what I do is I write this, and then I would take the negation of it, because complement is just like the opposite. So how do I write P as a subset of S? Of x. P of x implies S of x. And the whole thing right? negated. And that's true for all x, because no matter what x is, if it's in P, it has to be an S, and that's what subset means. Okay, so complement means I put a bracket and I negate the whole thing. Hmm. So that actually means that there exists some stuff, right? Because if I do De Morgan's on this, then I get there exists, there an, exists X. an X, not the quantity P of X implies S of X. So that would be there exists X, not not P or X, P of X or S of X. And then if I did De Morgan's again, I would get P of X and not S of X. Now if I were writing a proof with this, I'd probably label this x as x1, and then any time I did a there exists later, I would label that one as x2. The reason why I would do that is because I want to use simplification on this. So in my proof, I'm going to assume that those x1s are the same. So if I see x1 in a couple of places, I know I actually got it from the same source. So p of x and s of x p of x1 and s of x1 came from the same there exists. So it's okay to recombine them. Like if I wanted to put these back together with conjunction, I could. So then the proof on that one being uh, uh, q, q of x and <coughs> not r of x, is that how you would read that? Okay. The statement was p is a subset of S complement is not empty. So I didn't write the whole thing. Right. I just translated that part. So is not empty means that there's just a point that's in there, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, if I were to write that as a, you know, sort of a set theory statement, I would just say that there's an X1 in here. Okay. Or X2, just assuming that maybe it's different than what I put later. Okay, so there's something in there. So, actually, that's what I assumed here anyway, like the way I wrote this, it ended up looking like there's a point in P and there's a point in S anyway. That's a not S should be a not S, if anybody's getting confused by that, that simplification, that was a not S. So most of this is just translating the set notation to logic notation. Right. As soon as you can translate it to logic, it's the same as we've been doing proofs all semester. So, so. Just memorize what operators go with what. Right. You should know what there exists means. There exists just goes with X as a member of, right? Yeah. And for all, usually you get that either there's an all in the problem or there's an implication. Right, we get that from implications because if we have P as a subset of S, then for all X, if X is in P, then X is in S. That's, that's a definition of implication. So we have to use our subset definition. That's an implication, and it has a for all with it also. And we have union and we have intersection, right? We have to be able to write all of those with logic, which we've done lots of, so shouldn't be too bad. There's not going to be any multiplications. No, we're not doing cross products. Um, I mean, maybe like a problem with cross product, but not a proof problem that has a cross product. Okay. Um, with power sets, um, if the empty set is not listed, we automatically assume that it is there no matter what. So when we're listing out the power set, we do include the empty set. That is a good question. So let me answer that question. Power set. And the empty set.
This set is an empty set. It's a set containing zero things. Right? It's like a container. Is it also a power set? It's not a power set because it has zero elements and all power sets have power of two numbers of elements in them. And zero is not a power of two. See, I thought the empty set symbol represented a single item that would be contained. It is, but it's a set with only, it's a set with zero elements and power sets always have powers of two number of elements. So the question is, is if I want to say that this is a power set, what would it be a power set of? It can't be the power set of the empty set because the empty set has zero elements. Power set of it has two to the zero elements in it, which is one. So the power set of this is equal to the set containing the empty set. Okay. It has one element. I can also write it the very same problem like that. So whenever you see this, think of it as just, like here, this is actually as a set, so I'd prefer to write it like this, because I'm thinking of the empty set as a set. But if that occurs inside, I don't think of this as an empty set anymore. I think of it as a member of a set. It's an object that's in here. It's a container. It's just telling me that there's some empty space inside there. It doesn't mean it's nothing. Now this set, the empty set is not a member of the set containing AB. Okay. It's a subset. The empty <clears throat> set is a subset of any set. It's actually a subset of every single set. And that's why it's always in the power set. It's a subset of everything because if I take everything out, I'm left with two empty braces and that's the empty set. Right? Because remember how we generated the power set? We took all the ways of taking stuff out. First we took nothing out. Then we take one thing out. Then we take two things out. And so on all the way down to taking out everything. And we're left with just the brackets. So if I want to do the power set of AB, I could list elements starting by just taking nothing out, taking B out, taking A out, and then taking both things out. And that would be the power set. Now, the last empty set, could you do that with the empty set notation? Yes, okay. I can put that with the empty set notation there. All right. That's fine. That's fine. So does everybody remember my trick for finding power sets? The trick was just to do a substitution. So if you have something that looks very complicated, with lots of curly braces and empty sets or something. One more. <laughs> I would just do a substitution for this. I start with this open bracket, it goes to there. So I'm going to say that's just B. Then I would do the empty power set of AB, which, you know, after you do it for a while, you actually can just write them. And order doesn't matter, so that's the same as B A. This would give you almost all the credit. I might only take off like a point for not going back in there and subbing B back in. So this was sort of an intermediate step to make it make sure that you write everything right. Gotcha. And then I would go back in and plug in for B. So I would go back and plug it in, but I can tell you that this is way worth your time doing. <laughs> yeah. Right? <Okay. laughs> way. Because even if you didn't do this step, I wouldn't take off more than a point for not doing that. So when we're looking at the cardinality of this, these sets, is it that um, it's equal to 1 whenever you actually have the empty set written out, like is a 0? If it's written it? out, it's an element. Okay, but if it's just the empty brackets, then it's equal to 0? Right. Okay. So what I do is when I'm car counting cardinality, I count whatever's in between the brackets. So there's nothing in between the outside brackets, then the cardinality is 0. In this case, it's two, two. I don't count in this bracket, it's 2 because 
this thing gets closed up like a suitcase. Everybody remember that? Mm -hmm. You pair up the brackets and you count it as one thing. Just like you're at the airport and everybody's packed stuff and you don't care how many containers are in there, you gotta carry one thing. So you match up the braces and count it as one element. So this is one set right here. It contains two things. One of the things contains a couple of other things, right? It actually contains one thing. Cardinality, that is one, right? Yeah. It does contain stuff. It does. It contains containers. Containers. I Try not to think about empty stuff, because as soon as you start thinking empty, you start thinking no, or none, or zero. It's not, it's not the same, right? So think about containers instead of nothing, because nothingness messes you up. So don't get messed up with nothingness. Like Treat it like anything else. It's a thing. Okay. More questions? My question is, when are y'all going to bring pizza to class? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so we have some, you have some tests online, you know, from last time so let me just look over there and see if we've got if we've sort of talked about all of these things there are two there was an in-class test and a take-home test there's two you have to look at both of them so we had a question about cross product on that test we had Intersection, so you should be able to take two sets, take the cross product. You've done this on homework lots of times. Take the intersection of two sets, take the union of two sets. What is this? Take the difference of two sets. A minus C. Oh, good. I can zoom some more. Here we go. So what is A minus C? That's elements that are in A but not in C. That's what A minus C means. It's like whatever's in A, just take out all the stuff you saw in C. It means that I don't care about the stuff that's in C. That's why I would bother with this. Okay? And the power set, we just talked about doing power sets. And one of the questions on that old exam is, power set has 256 elements. How many elements does S have? The log of that. Right? So whatever, 256 is 2 to the 8th, right? So there are 8 elements in S. Right? Do you all remember how we got, how we could count up those numbers? Like why the power set has that many things? Does everybody remember? Because remember the binary representation that we did of a set? So say that I started with, well, it's huge hands. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, remember if we started with a set AB, can you, can you tell this is my favorite set? Okay, if I start with the set AB, I can make a binary representation of all the subsets of this set. Right? All the subsets would be all the ways of leaving elements in or taking elements out. So I could take out both of them and put zeros for not having A and not having B. Or I could take just A out and have B in there. Or I could leave A in and take B out or leave both of them in there. So each element gets a binary bit, bit position and I put a zero if it's not in there and I put a one if it is in there. And so the power set is all of these four things. This is the empty set, right? This is the set containing B, the set containing A, and the set containing A and B. So the way we can tell it has two to the number of elements is we have one position per element and then two binary values per position so it's however many values times however many values. So it's 2 to whatever number there are. Because if I have n positions, I have 2 times 2 times 2 all the way up to n. So that's 2 to the n. So there were four possibilities here. And that's why the power set has a power of 2 number of elements. Okay, so we already talked about um, set theory and predicate calculus proofs. We already did a quantifier table. Um, on the old test, 
there was a proof of proving that square root of 3 or square root of 5 is irrational by contradiction. Let me do another piece of paper for that. So that's one of our arithmetic proofs. That's an arithmetic proof because we didn't do it by induction, and we used arithmetic in it. So it was by contradiction, so we started with negation of the conclusion. Negation of the conclusion says that square root of 5 is rational. Then we use the definition. So in these kind of problems, all we have are definitions, so that's what you have to use. So I have to use the definition of rational, which is? I can write it as a ratio of p over q, and I can write it, I can reduce it also, because we have to have something to contradict, so we'd say we reduce it so they have no common factors, and then we would look for common factors. So you have that in your notes. It's also in one of the books, I think it might be in both of the books, both the Haggerty text and the Rosen text, I think, have this proof. Take a look in them, but the proof is in there, and we had to do a little side proof, right? Because we ended up getting that, say in this case, it would be 5 divides p squared, right? And we wanted that to imply that 5 divides p. So we'd make a truth table for that, right? And how many cases would we have in it? 5. Because I would make a table for p, sorry, a column for p and a column for p squared. That's how I would do this problem, just like this. I'd put 5k, 5k plus 1 all the way down to 5k plus 4. And then I would fill out the rest of the table. Okay, so that would be part of the proof, and then I would go back and plug in for P, and it's sort of like a proof that you have to do the same thing twice. To get the factors of Q, it looks exactly like getting the factors of P, and we get that 5 is the factor of both of them. So if I tried to do this proof for square root of 4, why would it not work? Because... because uh you would end up getting P and Q don't have numbers that each can be divided by. Right, so normally we were getting that whatever the number under the square root was a factor of the number. But the way, the, the way that this breaks down is that if 4 divides P squared, that doesn't imply that 4 divides P. Right? It implies what? 2. Divide. 4 divides P squared actually implies that 2 divides P. We could prove that by truth table. I'm not going to bother because it's not too hard of a proof. You guys can prove that. You know if a number is divisible by 4, if you take the square root, that's going to be divisible by 2, right? Yep. Okay, good. I'm glad you know that. All right. So that would end up, so what we would have normally originally wrote, written is that square root of 4 is equal to P over Q, and that was reduced, and then we would have gotten that 4Q squared equals P squared, and then we would have said, oh, we would like to have that, but we couldn't. So now we know that 2 divides P, so P equals 2K, and I would plug in there, right? So I get 4Q squared equals 4K squared. Ooh, big problem, right? Because now I can't get any factors of Q. Q squared equals K squared. K squared. I can't get any more factors of anything because K is just another integer. So that's why the proof breaks down, because this doesn't work. So you might feel like you're just doing this automatic procedure, but there's parts of it that won't work if the problem's not going to, if you can't prove it, it won't go all the way through. So if you can prove it, it'll work. Okay, so... This on the test, proof that the square root of 4 is rational by contradiction? Could you just say that 2 is rational? If I wanted to prove that square root of 4 is rational, mm -hmm. um, that would be really easy proof because I would say 2 is rational, 2 squared equals 4, so square root of 4 equals 2. Yeah. And that's a rational number. So I would have to just show that it was equal to a rational number. That would be the last thing I'd have to do. Let me just go through the rest of these problems and see if we've talked about everything. We've done lots of induction. So we, we know that induction works, that has induction and recursion go hand in hand, right? If I do a recursion and I have to prove it by induction, prove something's true about it, I have to build the induction the same way the recursion works. 
So the basis has to have the same number of points as the recursive step. The assumed statement has to have the same number of assumptions as the recursive step. And the proof statement has one, usually. So do some practice problems with summations at home with induction. Find, um, find some recursive forms for some functions. It's just like your homework. You've already done all these kinds of problems. So look over your homework papers four through six. And that's going to be it. So are there any more questions? Okay, last second. Let's just talk about big O just for a second. So why do we do big O again? We're, find, we're finding sort of the order of growth of functions, right? So we do big O just to find that the order of growth, like how fast does something grow so we can compare two things. So if I draw a picture of the set, like big O, because we're talking about a set. Big O is a set of stuff, right? So big O of x, let me say I have big O of x squared. If that's a set, what kind of stuff is in there? X is in there. X squared is in there. Constants are in there. Any CX. Log X is in there because it's smaller than X squared. So now we've got the idea that big O of X squared is all the stuff that's smaller than or equal to a constant times X squared. So big O of X is actually a subset of big O of X squared. Right? So what this really, like if you think of big O, I also think of this as upper bounds of the function that's in those parentheses. So upper bounds for x squared. Actually, it's not upper bounds, it's lower bounds for x squared. The set is actually lower bounds for the stuff that's in here. If f is in there, sorry, if f if it's in, is in big O of G, I'm finding an upper bound for F. Because G contains lower bounds. Big O of G is lower bounds of G. So it's kind of like a little confusing, but if you remember the definition, what's the definition? This will be the last thing. The definition, F is in big O of G if F is less than or equal to CG. And then you can go back and put your quantifiers in, right? for x greater or equal to x0. So we have to say there exists an x0, there exists a c, and then for all x. Or those are my quantifiers. And so this is how I actually remember. Sometimes I get confused about which one's which, but I go back to the definition every time, and that's how I can draw my sets and figure out what's inside them. It's by remembering that f is in big O if f is little. All right, that's enough for today. We'll see you next time for the test.